I think we need to reframe education from the point of view that it's not only about knowing the right answers. And look, I know we have a government hell-bent on testing our children to know they know the right answers. However, I think we need to make a shift from not only knowing the right answers to also knowing how to behave when the answers aren't immediately apparent. What do your students do when they don't know? What do they do when they're stuck? What do they do when the escalator stops? Do they just stand there and freeze? Or do they know how to get themselves out of that situation? Do they have skills and dispositions? And for me, dispositional teaching is the key to it. And this is not something we add on to what we're already doing, but weave into what we do in our classroom environments. Doing some uh, professional development workshops at schools in the next week or so, and one of the schools I'm going to said to me, I said, what do you want me to present on? And they said, oh, anything you like. <laughs> Love those ones. <laughs> anything you like. I said, well, are you looking at the habits of mind? Are you looking at classroom environment? Are you looking at creation? What, what are you looking at? And they went, oh, we've done the habits of mind. I said, have you? Okay, you've done the habits of mind. I said, so what are, you, what are you going to do this year? They said, we're looking at negotiated learning. They want the children to be able to negotiate their own learning with the teachers. So here's what I said. And by the way, here are the 16 habits of mind according to Art Costa and Ben Akalik. And we know these are not the um, only list. And we're not precious about these being the only dispositions. We know they are the ones that the habits of mind are framed against, but that's why Art and Bena wrote their book to reframe and saying, we're not saying these are the only ones, there are so many more, but it's about the disposition, not the label of the disposition. And so they said, we've done habits of mind, we're doing negotiated learning. And I said, well, what does that, will that entail your students to be able to do? to be able to negotiate learning. And, they, and I'm not sure, I was told. I said, what? Well, they need to listen to each other and uh, well, you need to have good listening skills to do that. They said, yes. I said, would questioning skills be useful? Questioning and problem posing? They said, yes. I said, will there be times that maybe in negotiated learning, children have to take responsible risks and give things a go even though they're not sure? They said, yes. I said, will there be times in negotiated learning that children need to persist? and stick to a task. I said, yes, but they've done habits of mind. <laughs> See, we get stuck on a label of a program rather than understanding what is the nature behind that. So what I will be teaching are the habits of mind with different labels, dispositions, because they are the skills these children need to be able to negotiate learning possibly all 16 of them. But we'll go in and have a look at them and see. So please don't get hooked up on the label, but I want to just give you uh, some quick uh, ideas and also base some of this in some neuroscience. So you understand that these aren't just uh, dispositions that were picked at random, but they are heavily based in neuroscience. So let's have a look. I love this quote from the Teachers Matter conference last week from Eric Frankenheim. Many of our children are failing because we as teachers are not being explicit enough. We actually have to teach children how to persist, not just hope that they know how. You have to teach children how to listen, not just hope they already know and say, I want you to listen up. My daughter says, I was listening, Mum but I didn't understand. That's different, isn't it? She heard it, she just didn't understand what they, what they meant. So we actually have to understand uh, and teach explicitly what our students need to know in these skills and these dispositions. So here, have a look. Persisting. This is about being able to stick to a task, about if plan A doesn't work, you try plan B. If plan B doesn't work, you try plan C, D and E. And you, keep, you look for other ways to do this. By the way, none of these habits of mind work alone. You can't put them in a box and say just persist. 
To be able to persist, you also have to be able to think flexibly, perhaps. Maybe you need to take a responsible risk. Maybe you need to manage your impulsivity. None of them are work alone. They all work in concert, just like the juggling balls, just like the employee with the hammer working in concert with other tools. It all works in concert together. So persisting, persevering, sticking to it. Now, the neuroscience is quite fascinating on this. And when you think about early humans and the evolution of humans, the hunters that went out and got the meat were the people that ate the protein, which developed the brain, which caused us to be more intelligent, which of course then in turn, the other people who persisted to be able to get the meat, to be able to, so it's based right back into evolution, some of these. These are not just 21st century skills, but they're just as essential in the 21st century. We're not saying people in any other century didn't persist, we're just saying maybe it's a very important skill to be making sure our children know how to do now. Of course, if you're explicitly teaching this in a classroom, you might have children write what does it look like, sound like, and feel like to persist. Oops, there it is. You might have uh, children write uh, stories about when they have persisted. This child says, I, I persisted when I couldn't write and I kept practicing and my mum and dad helped me. So even this, though this child is working on persisting and talking about persisting, when your mum and dad help you, that's thinking interdependently. So there's two habits, just or dispositions, just pulled right in there. My favourite slide from a classroom in Nelson is this one here. The children have been making pom-poms. And what I love is that the teacher is very clear. It's not about the pom-pom. Who are your children becoming because of your teaching and learning? We have been persistent. We're becoming persistent learners. To make pom-poms, it takes persistence, doesn't it? But they're hard to make. They're really hard to make. So we need to be able to help our students by uh, showcasing they are using these and giving them role models that use these as well. What about this one? Managing impulsivity. It is normal for children to be impulsive. But there are times we want them to manage it. And we also need to understand from a neuroscience point of view that being able to manage your impulsivity actually is biological and environmental. Biological and environmental. So when you see threat, it's biological. If something threatens you, it's a biological thing to, for your brain to uh, need to act impulsively. Run, fight, freeze. So fight, flight, freeze. Interesting, uh, in Australia last week, all over the news, they're talking about the one-punch rule, law, one-punch law. Now, some of that is biological. If you are threatened, there's no thought process happening. It would be automatic to punch somebody if they're threatening you or a loved one uh, in that instinct to protect. That's part of humanness, a human being. However, we also have to understand there needs, there's an environmental factor as well. That when you're out in the car and the car in front of you pulls in front or uh, doesn't indicate or and that road rage happens, that we can learn not to do that if we take the time to stop and think about it. So being able to help our children learn when environmentally uh, is appropriate to stop and think and also understanding that at some point it's a biological thing for the brain to be impulsive, to be able to keep ourselves safe. So in a classroom, uh, young children love this. Here is a child saying, you don't call out at assembly if you lose a tooth, you wait till assembly is over. <laughs> <coughs> Gorgeous, right? Uh, here is another classroom. How many things can you think of in one minute? When you're small, one minute is a very long time, <laughs> just to be quiet and think. Actually, when you're big, one minute is a very long time, isn't it? Just to be quiet and think. 
it's a long time. So being able to help our children. Also, this was a poster I found years ago in a classroom where the children described the difference between being an owl and a frog. I said, what is the difference between being an owl and a frog? And they said, well, a frog blurts and an owl thinks. So are you being the frog or the owl in this classroom environment? This teacher combined two ideas, that frog and owl, and they brainstormed the characteristics of the frog and the owl. Uh, I don't know where you get a frog doesn't care. My question is about what? Right? Or a frog, what is the other thing it says? Um, is not patient. <laughs> right. But as an analogy, it works. Right? As a metaphor, it works for these children to be able to, which are you being? Uh, around the outside, you'll see there are sources of uh, M&Ms. A teacher in Brisbane went into her classroom at lunchtime, uh, secondary school, put a, a little thing of M&Ms on every child's table, came back, after lunch said nothing, taught all afternoon, five minutes before the bell went, she said, please get your M&Ms out. Kids are going, what M&Ms, miss? She went into a role as you can as a teacher and, what do you mean you ate them? She said, at lunchtime I'd soaked them in laxative. <laughs> now, when she had, to, she had to tell them what that meant and the effects, and when she did that, she said to them, oh, one of the boys went, oh, I'll be on the bus then. <laughs> he was absolutely petrified, but what an amazing way to introduce it, explicitly help children understand that if you don't manage your impulsivity, sometimes there could be major consequences. <laughs> sometimes there could be major ones. Um, but what about our, our, our teenagers and our children coming up through technology? Here are the beggars of the future. So many employers right now are asking for access to Facebook pages before they employ. Whether it's ethically or morally right or wrong, they're doing it. And if you don't give them access to your Facebook page, and is it, I mean, there's a whole lot of things to talk about there. Is it okay that what you do in the weekends affects your weekday? And who you are outside the work environment? There's a whole lot of moral and social and uh, uh, issues, ethical issues we have to maybe discuss, but it's happening. So are we able to manage that impulsivity? and not post those things that could be potentially embarrassing many years down the track. Next one. Of course, we want our children to be able to listen with understanding and empathy. Listening is a disposition that is so important in the 21st century yet, or in any century, yet 55% of our life we spend listening and it hasn't been taught. Many times when we're listening to somebody, what we're really doing is rehearsing what we're going to say not really hearing what they are saying. So can we practice this? And can we uh, model this? Because the neuroscience around this one is fascinating. If you come from a home with high listening skills and high empathy, you will have high listening skills and high empathy. If you come from a home that nobody listens and nobody has empathy, you are unlikely to have that kind of the, list, the strong listening skills and empathy from someone who comes from that supportive home. And I'm sure Celia Lashley will say the same thing tomorrow. And 